It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Episode 227, Cyrus' Death and the Completion of the Second Temple. Cyrus has been conquering nations all of his life, and he's been getting rather old to be fighting in battles. Yet after the capture of Babylon, he seems to take a bit of a break, but only for a little while. And instead of enjoying his empire, he goes on campaigns, taking himself to the stretches of his empire. He wants to go beyond his borders. He wants more territory. And maybe we tear a lesson from the Josiah textbook from, with the death of Cyrus. He fought in one too many a battle, a battle too far, a bridge too far. He stretched himself like he always did, but beyond the limits of protection and anointing. He was beyond his reach, and he met his end in a horrible fashion. And it's hard to swallow stories like these, especially to God's shepherds. But his anointed purpose of taking Babylon and releasing the Jews is over. Now, well, maybe it's time to retire. Approaching his 70s, maybe the battlefield wasn't the place to be. Raging war across the planet probably wasn't God's plan for him at the age of 68. Considering his age, I've got to think he was supposed to be writing his memoirs, instead of conquering another nation. The boldness of youth is not on his side. Also, the favor of God leaves him quite obviously in this next scene. So Cyrus has basically run out of countries to conquer um, in most ways to look at it. Everywhere he turns, there's a desert or water like the Caspian Sea or an allied nation. He's conquered basically all of them. Well, not all of them. To the west of the Caspian Sea was a nation called the Massengeti. It's a people group. Um, and historians kind of like to group them with the Scythians, though it's kind of a, a group label. Um, they're horsemen and archers. They're great warriors. And they were behind their time and technology, but they were hard country folk. Pardon the expression. Their queen was Tamaris, a widowed woman, whose son was the prince and future king. His name was Spargebides. Well, Cyrus is old, and he knows it, but not like he should. He chooses to invade her country, and he starts to build a bridge over the river that separates their lands, and she sends him a message. She says, leave or die, but if you choose to fight, well, cross the river, and I won't contest you, and I'll fight you on the third day. Otherwise, withdraw, and I will chase you, and I'll fight you on the third day. Cyrus chooses the advantage of her offer. He withdraws a majority of his army army, three days march away. He takes maybe a third of his army and hides them away and leaves just a small amount of them in his camp. See, this is kind of a strange thing where she she kind of, you know, offers him battle in different versions and, and he chooses to accept it, um, hoping to kind of have a ruse and to um, attack her as she separates her army. Um, and it's interesting as, it, as it, this is Herodotus's account, and Herodotus says that um, Cyrus holds a council of war, and there's a man there, and his name is, is Croesus, and Croesus gives him advice. Now, this is the weird part, because many historians say Croesus is dead, Herodotus says he's still alive, that's the whole mixed bag of Croesus, um, of is he alive or dead at this time, but Croesus gives this advice... Remember, Croesus represents the vanity of man, and he, re- he gives this advice to Cyrus to send most, most of his army away in a, kind of a ruse and leave only maybe a third of his army um, and then this small group um, back at his camp. So there's a strange division of armies that Cyrus does here under the advice, if we go with this, of Croesus, the va- which, of course, this would be vanity of man. Well, Tamaris takes the bait, and she goes in, and she just smashes into uh, this small division um, of troops that 
um, Cyrus has in this camp, and her son, Spagades, and a third of her army takes the camp, and Cyrus purposefully leaves enormous quantities of wine for them um, and, and huge amounts of food. Um, Spagades, Tamaris' son, gets extremely drunk, and Cyrus comes in and kills off or captures a third of Tamaris' army, including her son. Well, Cyrus is master of the field, but Tamaris sees what happens with two-thirds of her army remaining. She refused to fight and ask for her son's life to get given back to her. Cyrus has lots of second thoughts here. Um, here he is, you know, this small nation that he's invaded. He only has a fraction of his army, but now he's basically has the upper hand. He, he's taken a third of her army um, he, with a much smaller force of his own, but he also has the, you know, the son of the queen. It's enough bargaining power for him to pretty much make a favorable truth in it, truce in his case. But according to Herodotus, Cyrus is having second thoughts. And he's, he appears to be walking down the mercy road. You know, he's 68 years old. He doesn't want to come off ruthless. He just wants to kind of negotiate and kind of end this uh, challenge that he started with this queen, um, Tamaris. And he relents, and he's hoping to come to an arrangement for concessions and submission to him. Spagades, shamed for his behavior when he comes out of his drunken stupor, and he's, when he's released, instead of running to Tamaris, he goes and finds the nearest weapon and kills himself. When Tamaris finds out, she flies into a rage and attacks Cyrus, who only had a portion of his army because he sent it away in this strategy. She deployed archers in flanking positions and murderously charged Cyrus. Both sides fought bravely, and the battle was inconclusive until nightfall. Upon nightfall, all of the Persians were killed or fled for their lives. In the carnage, the body of Cyrus was found. Tamara, still in her rage over the death of her son, committed horrific crimes against the body of Cyrus, chopping off his head, cursing him, and I quote Jacob Abbott from the history of Cyrus the Great to conclude his life and a bit of commentary on world conquerors. This is what he said. This was the end of Cyrus. Cambyses, his son, whom he had appointed regent during his absence, succeeded quietly to the government of his vast dominions. In reflecting on this melodramatic termination of the great conqueror's history, our minds naturally revert to the scenes of his childhood. And we wonder that so amiable and gentle, a generous boy who became so selfish and unfeeling and overbearing as a man, but such are the natural and inevitable effects of ambition and an inordinate love of power. The history of a conqueror is always tragical and a melancholy tale. He begins life with an exhibition of great and noble qualities which awaken to us who reads his history, the same admiration that was felt for him personally by his friends and countrymen while he lived, and on which the vast ascendancy which he conquered over the minds of his fellow men, and which led to his power and fame, was in great measure founded. On the other hand, he ends life neglected, hated, and abhorred. His ambition has been gratified, but the gratification has brought with it no substantial peace or happiness. On the contrary, it was filled his soul with uneasiness, discontent, suspiciousness, and misery. The history of heroes would be far less painful in the perusal if we could reverse this moral change of character, so as to have the cruelty, the selfishness, and the oppression exhaust themselves in the comparatively unimportant transactions of early life. Spirit of kindness, generosity, and blessing and beautifying its close. To be generous, disinterested, and noble seems to be necessary as the precursor of great military success, and to be hard-hearted, selfish, and cruel is the almost inevitable consequence of it. The exceptions to this rule, though some of them are very splendid, are yet very few. Isn't that an interesting reflection? It's hard to find conquerors and heroes with character, but hey, some of them are very splendid but very few. The result of Cyrus's death is the succession of the Persian Empire. His son, Cambyses, takes the throne. 
So the names get confusing, and there's the, this co-regent part too, which makes it even more challenging. Where, you know, a lot of the timelines historically, so you you got a king, and then you have the next king, and they'll say one's king for forty years, and the next for twenty. And historians have been trying to fit together all these timelines perfectly, but the issues are these co-regencies. So maybe this one king for the last five years of his life is co-ruling with his son, and it creates these problems. Also, there's there's names, and then there's surnames, and then there's um, names that they go by, and you have all these challenges. Um, I, I do need to mention, I said before that Darius was the son of, um, of Cyrus, that's not true. Cambyses is the son of Cyrus. Um, there is reference to different names through the book of Daniel, and I kind of throw you off. Um, so yeah, I mentioned Darius in error. Um, he was not the son of Cyrus. Cambyses is. The succession of Cambyses goes fairly smoothly, but the succession creates opportunities for Israel's enemies. Cyrus' needless ambition to conquer the Masangeti had disastrous consequences for the rebuilding project and the Jews in Jerusalem. Back in ancient times, the temple was the heart of a civilization, especially in the case of the Jews. It was their spiritual and cultural center of their civilization. Without it, enemies had no fear of them. With it, they had a viable opponent to deal with. Again, the enemy is trying his best to prevent the birth of a nation. The embryo to birthing an infant stage is the physically weakest time for anything. First, the enemies of the Jews tried to slip in subtly, Ezra 4. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Jerubbabel to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esahardin, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the people around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrated their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. You have no part with us, is his statement. You have no part in us. We'll hear more than once in this time period. There is an assimilation of the peoples over the last 70 years of migrants that um, are losing out now, now that the Jews have arrived back in Israel. Now, this could be, you know, those future Samaritans. They could be um, Edomites moving in, Ammonites moving in, even some Egyptians. There could be all sorts of peoples in the Jerusalem now, um, but they're being pushed out as the Jews come back. And with the support um, of Cyrus and the Persians, there really isn't a lot of, you know, physical resistance, but there's going to be a lot where they try to, you know, get into the city or um, come against them, undermine them as much as they can. Now, when Cyrus's decree forces them to move, there isn't a lot they can do. But when Cyrus dies, that opens a door for them to legally present the facts and lies about the Jews as they see them, distorting the truth to the Persian leadership for them to stop the building project. They write a letter to Artaxerxes the king at this time, and they send this letter, we actually have it in Ezra 4, 12. Here's the letter. The king should know that the people who came up to us from whom you have gone to Jerusalem are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They're restoring the walls and repairing the foundations. Furthermore, the king should know that if the city is built and its walls are restored, no more taxes, tribute, or duty will be paid, and eventually the royal revenues will suffer. Now, since they are under obligation to the palace, and there is not proper for us to see the king dishonored, we are sending this message to inform the king so that a search may be made in the archives of your predecessors. In these records, you will find that this city is a rebellious city, troublesome to kings and provinces, and a place with a long history of sedition. That is why this city was destroyed. We inform the city that if this city is built and its walls are restored, you will be left with nothing in trans-Euphrates. See the lies and fear they're projecting? I mean, they're just building the temple, but they're actually saying they're rebuilding the walls as well. And they even are using a geopolitical situation 
to turn their tide their way. I mean, they've got the death of the one king, and they've got another in place now. But unfortunately, the king was swayed by them and agreed to not allow them to continue the building project. Clearly, Daniel was dead at this stage, and other people of influence were not part of this decision. The reply from the king is in Ezra 4.18. The letter you sent to us has been read and translated in my presence. I issued an order, and a search was made. It was found that this city has a long history of revolt against the kings and has been a place of rebellion and sedition. Jerusalem has had powerful kings ruling over the whole of trans-Euphrates. The taxes, tribute, and duty were paid to them. Now issue an order to these men to stop work so that this city will not be rebuilt until I so order. Be careful not to neglect this matter. Why, let this threat grow to the detriment of the royal interest. And as soon as the copy of the letter of King Artaxerxes was read, they went immediately to the Jews in Jerusalem and compelled them to force to stop. Thus the work on the house of the God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. See, this legal battle is now going to have to kick in. See, it's become an issue of legalities in the political realm. And let's consider the importance of having believers in the political realm in every area of society. I mean, without Christian politicians or people of influence in governments, ungodly decisions can be made that impact the world. Consider just the influence you could have even indirectly with a friend that's a congressman. It's incredible. In this case, there was no one to deter an ungodly decision. After Daniel's death, there was a political vacuum. Could it be too many left Persepolis and Babylon and left a political vacuum in the courts of the Persians that was filled with the ungodly? Maybe some should have stayed behind to deter the ungodly decision-making. Imagine if all of our godly politicians found a quote-unquote higher calling to start churches and ministries and left Washington, D.C. Or, or your state governments. Most likely church attendance would increase and new churches would show up in many places. There'd be great teaching and preaching. The, the inverse would occur as well, though. The ungodly would rise up and take their previous positions of authority in the political realm. This episode shows how important and how wily our enemy is. We must stand our ground everywhere he can oppose us. I believe God has placed a destiny in every believer to step into their place in the world, whether it's in business, politics, the home, the church, wherever. Whatever the calling he has put in your heart is the place where he wants you to be. It's the place of a, uh, where he wants his presence, where he wants your representation of the kingdom on earth. Unfortunately, the temple work will now stall for a significant period of time until Israel rises again in protest. The legal contest, though, continues, but time has been lost getting, into, uh, getting until an audience with the king can, can be made and the calling for archives to be researched and pulled and confirmed. Take wisdom from this. If you're on a timeline, don't get legal involved. Legal matters are never fast. Now, after some time... Um, I mean, we're talking, you know, over a dozen years. Uh, it appears these, the, the troublemakers in Israel are not there anymore. Uh, there's also turnover in Persepolis, um, and Darius is now king. It, and it's almost like uh, uh, the, the Jews catch wind of what's going on, and it's like the, the power bases are gone. Um, the challenges are not before them. The people who disputed them and the king that was there before were pre weren't present. They weren't paying attention. And they just decided to rebuild the temple, even though they were told not to before. Um, Ezra 5. Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, the descendant of Ido, prophesied the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Zadok, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. And at that time, Tetanai, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shelbathar, Badazan, and their associates went to them, and they said, Who authorized you to rebuild this temple and to finish it? They also asked, What are the names of those who are constructing this building? But the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews, and they were not stopped until a report could go to Darius and his re written reply be received. This is the copy of the letter that 
that was written, basically, uh, to King Darius, cordial greetings. The king should know that we went to the district of Judah, the temple of the great God. The people are rebuilding it with large stones and placing the timbers in the walls. The work is being carried on with diligence, is making rapid progress under their direction. We questioned the elders and asked them, Who authorized you to rebuild this temple and finish it? We also asked them their names so they could write down the names of the leaders for your information. This is the answer they gave us. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. We are rebuilding the temple, and this was built many years ago, one that the great king of Israel built and finished. But because our ancestors angered the God of heaven, he gave them into the hands of the Nebuchadnezzar, the Chaldean king of Babylon, who destroyed this temple and apported the people to Babylon. How in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house. He even removed the temple of Babylon. He even removed from the temple of Babylon the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem and brought them to the temple in Babylon. Then King Cyrus gave them to the man named Shels Baser, whom he had appointed governor, and he told him, Take these articles, go deposit them in the temple in Jerusalem, and rebuild the house of God on its site. So the Shesbeser came and laid the foundation of the house of God in Jerusalem. And from that day to the present, it's been under construction, but it's not finished yet. Now if it pleases the king, let a search be made for the royal archives of Babylon to see if King Cyrus did in fact issue a decree to rebuild this house of God in Jerusalem. Then let the king send us his decision in this matter. I mean, isn't it just wisely done? They... They, they saw the moment. They knew it was an ungodly decree that forced them to stop. The environment changed, and they just restarted building again. And then when they came and confronted them, they had their legal, basically their lawyers were ready. And they said, here is our response, and, and they kept building. It was non-confrontational. It was not physical at all. There was probably no weapons. I mean, the guys are just... You know, they're just sliding stones in, and uh, you don't hear any hammers either because the way this temple's laid, it's all kind of fit together. It's very wisely done. And the response was an acceptance of their work to be continued. The demonic opposition, the demonic legal opposition was put down. Justice has been served, tedious and slow, but done. So when Darius pulls all the documents... Uh, and he pulls the right ones, obviously, because he pulls from Cyrus. Um, and it's not a skewed legal position. He not only pulls the documents and says, yes, they may finish their temple. Moreover, it's to be fully paid out of the royal treasury. Whatever is needed will be given to you. We will, we will bless your enterprise. Not only we're not even ceasing it, we're blessing it. And, and this is how he ends it. Furthermore, I decree that if anyone defies this edict, the beam is to be pulled from his house and they're to be impaled on it. And for this crime, their house is to be made a, a pile of rubble. May God, who has caused his name to dwell there, overthrow any king or people who lifts a hand to change this decree or destroy this temple in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have decreed it. Let it be carried out with diligence. Now the business is done. Darius has decreed it. The temple gets completed. As the temple opens, there's great sacrifices and shouts of joy. Then they celebrate the first Passover in the temple. Ezra declares, the Lord has filled them with joy. And there's no more mention of weeping. It is only joy in their hearts as they celebrate the building of their temple. Their civilization has a concrete center. And though it is not mentioned, the glory of the Lord from Ezekiel's wild visions returns and rest upon the temple. To conclude this episode, let's consider the symbolism of this scene. What is a temple? It's a container, a place, like an ark that contains God's glory. Let's call it his resting place, the place where he abides. His presence hovers or overrides. These people dared to build another temple. The foundation, when it was laid, brought tears and shouts of joy. The foundation of the church is the apostles and prophets. The foundation of the church was torn up. It needed to be relayed. This relaying of the foundation represented the foundation of the church, their faith. The work commenced and these guys, these locals, these local chieftains opposed it. First they tried to intermingle to no avail. Then they used a legal system to try to cease the building of the church. 
they failed and the structure started to rise. Healthy pride rose up in their hearts as their cultural center, their faith, rose from the ground. The church, the community of believers, rose to new heights. Every day their faith was built up, their identity, their culture was affirmed until the surrounding, the outside of the structure was completed. The interior was worked day after day. The holy objects were returned. The sacred tables and furniture were rebuilt with the finest craftsmanship. Gold and bronze were formed into place. The seraphim and palm trees were placed upon the walls. Everything was ready, and the high priest stared into the Holy of Holies just before the veil was hung. Huh, he frowned. It was nearly empty. There was no ark. There's no mention of it in history after the invasion. The high priest ponders a thought. What are we to do without the ark? Where will your presence be? Where will your promise rest? Where will you dwell on earth without the ark? God probably smiled at this priest, for he would answer his question with action. But in time... The presence would come and dwell at the temple like before, for it was always promised, but all the more so when his son visits the very place, and the presence finds a home in every believer who calls upon his name. Where will your presence be? Where will your promise rest? One of the prophets said, Here I am, Lord, send me. Believers are blessed. For it is more like, here I am, Lord, fill me. It's your infilling of the Spirit which gives us power and strength over sin and authority to walk this planet to bring the good news and freedom to others. The temple is built. Israel has a foundation anew, and the exile is over. New struggles lay ahead in great conflict, but the second temple is here. The second temple would exist for another 500 years until 70 AD, where the Romans would destroy it. But the Spirit had already left the temple coming to every believer at Pentecost. No longer does God dwell in the temple made by human hands, for we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We weep when we reflect on times lost in sin and repentance, Yet we are filled with jubilant joy in one who redeemed us, and in turn, he fills us with joy, and he makes us a city on a hill. Rejoice that you and me don't have to petition the king of the world to allow us to build a temple or to have a foundation to erect a structure to contain God. But rejoice that God made you and me vessels of clay to be filled with him and carry his work on earth. Our legal battle was won on the cross at Calvary. By his blood shed on the cross, we have authority over sin, and no longer does endless sacrifices have to be made. For there was one atonement that satisfied the law for all eternity. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Message to Kings. Feel free to visit the website, message to kings.com, share the Facebook page, or if you want to chat, email us at message to kings at gmail.com.